Hello everyone, welcome to this video where we're going to be talking about seismic steel design in S-Frame. For this example, we're going to be looking at this four-story moment frame as our structure. And let's just assume that these beams, the horizontal elements that we're looking at, have been designed and the cross-section sizes that are being used have already been determined. So the sizes for the columns currently are being estimated and we want to get a proper design force and moment for the columns and then perform code checks using the seismic provisions in AISC 341. Now it's worth noting that the AISC and the CIS CISC codes in S steel do support seismic provisions, um, so that is something you can consider. Now these beam elements, they're yielding members. That's what those little symbols mean. And we're defining these using link elements. Now if I just look at the link elements a little bit closer here, and if I go into the link beam tool, we can see a few examples of our link beams have been defined for different cross-section sizes. And we're defining a link beam uh, using a hysteresis model to characterize the material plasticity uh, in the strong axis bending. And I can actually look at this a little bit closer. We're using the kinematic bilinear hysteresis model. And if I just drag this over here for this particular example, for the W760 by 147 uh, section, we've described this as having a high initial stiffness before it reaches a yield force of 1785 kilonewton meters, after which point no further increase in stiffness is, uh, is offered. We have a few others as well. So if I look at the W610 by 92, a smaller section, and I can look at this uh, curve as well, I can see here that the same initial stiffness is defined, but I have a yield force uh, that is slightly lower, 885.5 kilonewton meters. So just a few numbers just to give us kind of a sense of what we're working with here. Now the columns in our model, they're being defined using beam elements. Uh, so they're non-yielding. Uh, they can transfer shear forces, moments, uh, axial loads. Uh, so they don't have that yielding property. I'm going to go to the loads menu, uh, window, sorry, and I have a variety of load cases, as you can see. I have seismic forces, uh, which have been calculated ahead of time and applied to the one side of the model at each uh, story location. I have dead loads, which are comprised of a number of vertical uh, concentrated and joint loads, as well as uh, distributed loads. I have live loads as well on every force but the roof, notional loads in the lateral directions, and then some snow loads on the roof. And just to look a little bit closer here at our seismic forces load case, we have this scale of three set. Uh, so we're actually say, setting this scale uh, of three as kind of an upper limit for applied loads. We are intending to have this uh, structure yield. We want to just determine where this uh, occurs. That's why we're applying uh, a higher load uh, than necessary. Mm -hmm. Now to characterize this behavior, we could always run a nonlinear static analysis or a nonlinear quasi-static analysis. For this example, we're gonna run a nonlinear static analysis. So I just click on the analyze button and I'll run a nonlinear static analysis and I'm setting this up with 20 load increments. What that does is it breaks up these load vectors that we just saw into 20 even increments that are gonna be applied incrementally. And we're also including incremental results. So we're actually able to look at each load increment one through 20 as the load is being applied. And we're able to study that uh, kind of the, the lead up to the behavior that we're looking at. So I'll click OK to run the analysis. And the analysis is running here and you can see that we are getting a number of FYIs. We'll go into that more later on, but what we can see is that the model does start to experience some instabilities. And this is actually expected in this situation. So I'm just gonna look at the low combination results here. And I can see my low combinations uh, combine all the different low cases that we were looking at. But you can see that the parent low case is not solved. And underneath that, we have a number of different child low cases for each load increment or step. And if we just scroll down here, we can see that they're all solved up until this step number 10, where then we get this not solved uh, message. So basically the structure appears to have become unstable after load step 10 out of 20 or load increment 10 out of 20. So let's just look at 
load uh, load step 10 here. I'm just going to select this load case, or combination rather, and I'll display the moment diagrams. And maybe I'll just look at the front view. And I'm going to turn on the display of my moments here. Uh, if I'll just look at the maximum moments. And what we can see, the maximum moments in these beams here happen to be equivalent to one another, and that number may ring a bell. The 1785 kilonewton meters is actually equivalent to the yield point of our uh, hysteresis model curve. The same thing goes uh, up here. Uh, we actually have some similar behavior in the upper beams as well. Uh, so we are actually reaching that um, maximum bending that's allowed before we get into that plastic territory of our material model. I'm just going to right click on one of the joints here in the model. I'll right click on this one and I'll go to pushover curve. I'll just drag this over. And this is a plot that SRAM has generated for us based off the analysis results. It's a displacement versus base shear plot. And what we can see here, this is our starting point. And this is how our that joint is behaving as more base shear is being applied up until a point where it becomes no longer linear. And then we start to get into this nonlinear territory. And that seems to happen right around load case uh, 10, or step 10 rather. So if we look at load uh, step number 9, we can see that's actually right at the kind of the jog in the line here, the change in, uh, in slope. So it was linear up until step number 9. And step number 10, we do have some nonlinearity starting to occur. So we're going to use this step number 10 as the force uh, at this level that will be used for the column design in S steel. So we'll just keep in mind, step number 10 is the one that we want to work with. So I'm going to launch S steel now. I'll click on build steel design model. And I'll look at it from the front view again. And when we're working with uh, the design codes that support the seismic design capabilities like the AISC and the uh, CISC codes, we might be interested in using this seismic parameters uh, tool. So I can actually right click on this and view some of the seismic parameters that can be defined. First of all, we specified the SRF, SFRS or seismic force resisting system frame type as a special moment frame. That's one of the eight uh, different types of SFRSs that is supported under this uh, seismic design check. Now we can also look at other details on a more member specific basis as well. So still using this tool here, I'm actually going to view some of the data behind this. So I want to look at the frame type again. And here I can see, indeed, it is a special moment frame, uh, SFRS, which is just confirming what we saw earlier. And if I look at the scroll up here, the member type, I can see that there are two different member types defined. We have the beam uh, SFRS member type defined uh, for our horizontal members, our beams in our, our structure, and our columns, not surprisingly, are defined with the blue color uh, for columns. So I'm going to go ahead and run a code check, clicking this button right here, and I can select which load case I want to use. And you may remember, we wanted to look at the results uh, for step 10, which would indicate basically the design forces we're going to use to design our columns. That's where our beams start to yield, so we need to be able to resist those loads. So I'll click OK, and I'm going to run a code check, which is basically a design code uh, evaluation of the existing section sizes. Again, we're just using some best guess of our initial section size now, and using the code check is kind of a, a way of determining if that was actually a good choice of sections. So I'll click OK, and I'll go to the front view again so we can see everything front on. And what we can see is that for the most part, and I'm generalizing a little bit here, but the exterior columns seem to be fairly well designed. We're slightly above uh, the failing limit for the top ends of these columns here. The other ones are below the failure limit, uh, around 0 0.975, 0 0.94. So if we were to simplify this, and um, we could say that the exterior columns are doing relatively well. The interior columns, however, have higher utilizations where the demand is clearly exceeding the capacity and by a much wider margin. So we can say the middle is under-designed. 
and we might want to look at uh, choosing a new section. If I actually just right click on one of these members, I can click on the code details. And here under the code details for that particular column, I can see a number of different design checks have been performed according to the AASC 360 code. And this one here, the seismic column upper joint panel zone shear check is what's driving this uh, failing utilization. That's according to clause J10.9 of the AIC uh, 360 code. So we could look at a number of different ways of changing these sections, maybe not even just for this particular column, but for the structure as a whole. Uh, we have other YouTube videos that talk about the design uh, functionality within S-Steel. Now I'm not gonna go into that in much detail now. What I am going to just quickly do here is we'll just isolate that one column that we selected uh, just for now. We know it's failing. It has a utilization ratio 23% over its capacity. So the demand is exceeding its capacity by 23%. And we can use this command here, which is the override analysis sections with new sections. And this is a more manual approach to changing our section size for our uh, elements. And again, there are other methods of doing this in SDL. I'm just gonna show this one for now. So I just selected this one member and I'm gonna right click on this tool here. And you can see that it's highlighted the row that that uh, member is on. It's member number 13. It's showing me the section size that's being used for that column, a W610 by 341. And we know that that section size is failing the code checks currently. Now I'm gonna go ahead and uh, look at different methods for resizing the section. I could say, you know what, let's choose the next size up, which makes a lot of sense since we know that it's under designed. If it was over designed, we could just choose the next size down. So we have a few different options here. And I'm just gonna do this in a fairly manual incremental way, just to highlight how this can be done. So again, currently it's the uh, W610 by 341 section. I'll click assign to assign the next size up section. And now it's chosen a W610 by 372. The utilization ratio has dropped a little bit, uh, about 10%. And I can click assign again. And you can see after clicking twice, and we're now getting a utilization ratio in the acceptable range. Uh, we're using a cross section of, that is a W610 by 415 section. So this is just one way that we can resize the sections. Uh, for an entire structure, this may not necessarily always be the most efficient way, although there are ways to resize more than one section at a time using this approach. Uh, but it's just one method of many that you can employ. So we hope you enjoyed this uh, video. If you want to learn more about seismic analysis in S-Frame, we have online training courses available through the Altair 1 uh, training uh, system, as well as training on uh, steel design and a lot of other interesting topics.